Hey folks, my name is Chris Floyd. I'm the manager of Worm Slow, and I'm happy to present to you today a young man who's got a real enthusiasm for Georgia history, uh, who has done a great job reenacting and interpreting Georgia's past, and we're so glad that he can be here on this Memorial Day weekend, this commemoration of a war that's kind of been forgotten in Georgia's history, the War of Jenkins' Ear. And it was really the war that forged Georgia and created the identity of Georgia uh, that's lasted to this day. Now, Andrew Bellacomo is uh, going to interpret a soldier in the uh, 42nd Regiment of General Oglethorpe. This was the regiment that defended Georgia from the Spanish uh, during the War of Jenkins' Ear. And uh, Andrew is, Andrew's also got a, a website, right. georgiahandsonhistory.com. And he's also on Facebook, so Georgia Hands On History. And uh, Andrew's going to give you a, a talk in first person uh, as one of the soldiers in that regiment. And so if you could join me in a round of applause for Private Bartolomeo. Thank you. Good day to you all. And as he is, as mentioned, I'm Private Andrew Villacomo of His Majesty's 42nd Regiment of Foot, commanded by General Logan Fork, the founder of this colony, this young colony of Georgia, named for King George II of England. And we're, my, my detachment of the regiment is stationed at, at Fort Frederica on St. Simon's Island, about, about an hour south of here. Yeah. And, well, have you, have you been to the, back to the ruins of Captain Noble Jones's house? It, it was fortified. It, it was protected by a company of marines that he commanded. And the, the reason why it had to be fortified, why it had to be guarded, was that we are in the middle of a war, a war called the War of Jenkins' Ear. Probably curious name for a war, wouldn't you say? Are we fighting over an ear? Who's Jenkins? Well, it all starts really back in 1731 when, when a captain, a, a South Carolinian privateer captain named Captain Robert Jenkins was down in the Spanish main, down around down the Car Caribbean area, and he was attacking a, a Spanish merchant vessel smaller than his, and he was, he was a privateer commissioned by, by the governor of South Carolina. And, well, England and Spain for the past several years hadn't really been... Um, friendly. They hadn't been in, in an open war, but they weren't, they weren't friends or, or, or allies or anything. But, but he had slipped and got, uh, captured ships and, and gotten that money many times. It was privately as almost like a pirate, but with, a, with a government papers. And, and he had done this many times and he, he was very, very good at it. But this time, he wasn't so lucky. He found himself surrounded by three Coast Guard, Spanish Coast Guard vessels. And he was surrounded and, and rendered defenseless. And so they, the Spaniards, they boarded the vessel and, and well, right then and there, they could have killed every man on that ship and no one really would have said anything. They may not have, have, have known, or, but the, he was in Spanish waters attacking a Spanish ship. They, he thought, he probably thought that all his crew and he were going to get killed, but the Spanish didn't do that. They left, they left all his crew unharmed. And, and, and they, of course, they took everything of value off the ship. They took all the money. They took the guns, the cannons. They offloaded them onto their, their ship. They, they looted the vessel, but, but they, they let everyone, everyone go unharmed. But then they backed Captain Jenkins up to the mast and tied him up to his own mast. And then the Spaniard, the Spanish officer, drew his sword, took Jenkins here, and <coughs> cut it off. Cut it off. Then he picked up the bloody shriveled up here, down on the deck, and threw it back at him and said, this is what we do to English pirate dogs. And should your king, the king of England, had uh, be here, I would have done the same to him. And then they left with all the money. And the crew was on our all on the injury was, uh, was Captain Jenkins. And so he was there floating in the middle of the Spanish main with, with nothing. Well, he was... Now one ear, Captain Jenkins, and he, he reached down on the deck and, and picked up what, what had been taken from him, and he did perhaps what, what any normal man in the situation might do. He pickled his severed appendage. He pickled it in the jar and kept it for years. He, he, he went back to South Carolina with his crew, and he, he told his story to anyone who would listen. Anyone. 
and he told it to the, to the royal governor of South Carolina, and, and the governor said that he ought to, he ought to go to England and, and um, tell his story to the, to the king and to parliament. Perhaps something could be done about this. And he'd been, as um, according to him, he'd been terribly wronged by, by these um, vicious and bloodthirsty Spaniards. And he's just he, doing what he'd had permission to do. And so so he, went, he did just that. He went to England, and they had all of Parliament gathered up, all the hats, they, they, everyone, all the nobility, anyone who, who really was anyone at that time in England was there, and he told this story on the street, and uh, anyone who would listen there too, and they had everyone gathered, even, even the king and the first prime minister of England, Robert Walpole, and, and, and they, went, and he, there he was. He showed up, he wasn't exactly wearing his best, as you might think. He would be. He's going in front of the king. He was well dressed just as a as a, a poor, unfortunate sailor, and so he went in and he told his story. Apparently, he was a very good storyteller, and everyone in there was hanging on his every word. What was he going to say next? And he, he paced up and down the hall of parliament. And you know, you weren't, you, you weren't supposed to look the king in the face. So he looked, looked right down, and, and every time you get to the king at the end of the hall. And, but and then as he was finishing his stories, he's getting to the climax. He walked right up to the king, he looked him right in the eye, and pulled out this, this curious object from inside of his coat, slammed his jaw and pickled ear on the, on the table in front of the king, and, and said, and the Spaniard said that he would have done the same to you. Hmm. And well... Apparently, King George II, valuing both his heirs very, very highly, um, <laughs> he uh, was was apparently very angered by this, and and uh, war was eventually declared on Spain, um, to, on Spain in 1739. Now, you must imagine, out in the corner, the Prime Minister Robert Walpole, who was just just so no, he this is not at all what he wanted to do while he was in office. And, it, it was going to cost money, it was going to cost lives, and he thought it was a bad idea all the way around, but there weren't many supporters for that, and then they, they started the War of Jenkins' Ear. Now, the War of Jenkins' Ear was really a part of, and, and happening sometime at the same time as the War of Austrian Succession, which was fought in Europe at the time. They, they many battles, and pretty much anywhere around the globe where <coughs> several nations, several nations had and in Europe had formed together into a lions, almost like a war, world war, but, but anywhere on the globe where an English military man met a Spanish military man, it was kind of war. So the War of Jenkins Ear is kind of the, the, that part, that branch of that war that was fought in this part of the world. Much of it was fought in the Caribbean, the battles of, of Portobello and Cartagena, and, and that many of those. And, but what was our, how it connects with this place, this young colony of Georgia, was that, you must think, here's Robert Jenkins getting his ear chopped off in 1731, and, and in, in 1732, back in England, a young General Oglethorpe, or well, he wasn't general at that time, he was just James Oglethorpe, and, and um, he was, was, had this, this experiment, him and, and a group of trustees had this experiment, this noble experiment of Georgia. And in 1732, King George II, that very same king that had listened to Robert Jenkins go on and on, of course before that, signed the charter for this new colony of Georgia in America, and the trustees for the establishing of the, the, the colony of Georgia in America was founded. And now, the, it was governed not, it wasn't a royal colony, but it was governed by these trustees, and the only one of these trustees that ever went to America was General Oglethorpe. And so, during the founding, the colonizing of Georgia, all of this is at the same time as this war is building up with Spain. And so in 1739, when the War of Jenkins Ear is finally declared, Georgia is just in its establishing years. And most, most of the towns had to be fortified. And, and for this reason, my regiment, the 42nd Regiment of Foot, was recruited. And well, it's a good thing that General Oglethorpe took such measures to, to defend the colony because in July of 1742, our enemies to the south, it's the Spanish, had Florida. 
Uh, they invaded out from, from the Castillo de San Marcos, you may have heard of it, in St. Augustine, and came and on July 5th. I can remember seeing the general looking out there with his, with his spyglass over the water near on St. Simon's Island. See, we had two forts, two fortifications on St. Simon's Island. On the northwest side, we had Fort Frederica, and on the south end, we had Fort St. Simon's. And we were all at Fort St. Simon's because the Spanish were coming up from the south. And we'd gotten word of it ahead of time, and we were all sitting there waiting. And, and the general, we would look out over the water, and, and he would see, see, he saw white sails building up. And then every time you'd look, every hour, it can really look more and more, and, and there were more sails, and then more sails, and then more. And even then, soon, there were over 50 ships, a, a huge armada, a huge fleet was moving toward us, and, and it... As soon as they came in range, about 18 pounders at the fort, at Fort St. Simon's, they, they had to slip through the south end of Jekyll Sound, the south end of, of St. Simon's Island, and the north end of Jekyll Island, come relatively close, and they had to slip through this, this channel, and we fired upon them for a number of hours. It was over three hours. Uh, we cannonaded them very hotly. And the general is, is not like most generals, General Oglethorpe. He's in, in a way a very brave man, and in a way, you might want to say reckless, but he, he went out, he would go out in these ships. It was, sometimes he would be on land, where we were firing on, on these ships, and they were firing back, but other times he wasn't. Other times he was in the water, in a ship on the other side of the fleet, throwing bombs on the deck. There was so much smoke that sometimes we would lose sight of the boat that he was in. Someday, we, well, where's the general? I don't know. Oh, here he comes, coming out of the, the, the smoke, the fog of war. And, and well, we knocked many holes in the sides of those vessels. We, we were taking down masts. We were, we were killing men on decks. But you can put as many holes in a ship as you like. But unless you get one very crucial shot below the waterline, that ship is still a floating object. And, well, we didn't quite make that crucial shot below the waterline in those 52 ships, and they ended up coming right through and landing on St. Simon's Island on July 5th of 1742. They, they offloaded about 2,000 troops on the island, and, and well, at this point, we, we had, had, the general had to think, well, what were we to do? We, we, we could easily be surrounded by land and sea if we stay here in this fortification, and so we, we had, had to make the decision to retreat Fort St. Simons and make our way about six or seven miles up the island to Fort Frederica on the north end. And we, so, so we spiked the cannons, the general orders to spike the cannons, which, which was either putting the, the tip of our bayonet or, or our, our, any spike in the, in the touch hole of the cannon so it could not be used by the enemy because we wouldn't want them making use of anything we had and, and using it against us. So anything we could carry on our backs, we did. And we burnt what we needed to, and we made that, that treacherous journey through the night of the, the thick maritime forest. I can remember looking to either side and, and being afraid that a, a Spanish party would descend upon us, or, or their allied Indians, the Yomiti, at any moment could come right down. But finally we made it to Fort Frederica on the north, uh, north end of the island and relative safety. And now we stayed for two suspenseful days. We stayed there, and, and during this time, we were aided by, with, with the help of these, a rather strange type of warrior. They were Highlanders from Scotland. They, they came from, from the Highlands of Scotland, and you never know by the way they dress in their skirts or kilts as they call them. <laughs> but, but they are excellent warriors and they specialize in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And General Oglethorpe had recruited these men for the very purpose of protecting this colony, as did he with my regiment. And, well, it's a good thing he did that because on the 7th of July in the morning, about 9 o'clock, we heard a horse coming up Military Road, just outside the fort. And we, so we opened, we, we looked and saw it was one of our men, and we looked, and, and it was one of our scouts. And he had sweat on his brow, and, and he was out of breath, and he had a, 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 just fired his musket, and he said he just changed shots with the Spanish reconnaissance party of around 100 regulars and about 40 of their allied Indians, the young team. And, well, I would love, love to say that the, the, the thing was they were, they were within a half a mile or within a mile of, 
the gates of Frederica and so oval was furious. They would be there within a few minutes, but little did we know, they didn't know it. They didn't know exactly where Frederica was or exactly what it was, but they knew there was something there because these troops that they had been firing back at them two days ago had gone somewhere and they had seen this path and so they were kind of scouting it out. And, and so they, I would love to say that I was one of the men who responded immediately, threw on my cartridge box and grabbed a musket and bayonet, but I can't say that. I, well, my, my regiment was not entirely ready at the time, and we were caught off guard, as it were. However, the Scottish Highlanders, who I've previously mentioned, were ready for action and, and were standing under arms at the time, and, well, the, the Creek Indian warriors, they were always ready for a fight. And so, so he, General Logoport, being that that special type of general that he is, jumped on the first horse he saw and, and commanded anyone who, or all the Highlanders who were ready and all the Indians who were ready to storm out of the gates of Frederica. He also commanded that four platoons of my regiment come as soon as we could and we, we scrambled to get ready. But during this time, General Oglethorpe at the very front, you think most generals would have, would have sent their Indians and the Highlanders ridden out, stopped, you know, at the back, of the battle and said, you know, focus a little more on, on the right side, I want, I want shots there, uh, you know, in the center. Well, no, no, General Oglethorpe is not that kind of general. And he got there first. He rode his horse right into these Spaniards and two bullets actually bounced off of his steel breastplate or his bulletproof vest that he was wearing. And, and he, was, uh, he had several close calls like, it's over and over him. But as soon as he wheeled his horse around, he saw that the Highlanders were right there, and they closed in on the other side, and it worked like a charm. Also, the Indians that were, that were behind the Highlanders split up into two groups and split into the woods surrounding them. We couldn't see them. They, they were our only type of warrior that could move through the thick maritime forest so quickly and without notice, almost as if they were walking on open ground. They were very good at this, and, and and so, for about two minutes later, they came in on either side, and it was attacked from the front and the side. And most of the Spaniards, well, they scattered like cockroaches. They ran into the woods and got lost. Some, many of them streamed back up the way they came, or down to, to Fort St. Simons, where they had made camp. They had, they had kind of used our abandoned structure of Fort St. Simons for further their own, for the base camp of this expedition. And, but just as my regiment was marching up, uh, up not, not 15 minutes later, not even 10 minutes later, I believe, the smoke was clearing. There were dead Spanish bodies strewn on the ground. The Highlanders were cleaning their blade. And when it was all over, 12, about a dozen Spaniards had, had been killed, 12 more were captured, and 10 were wounded. But two of those captured <laughs> had been captured by General Logelthorpe himself. He had captured them at sword point. They dropped their weapons surrendered to him. And by the time my regiment arrived, we Oglethorpe was, was general was deciding what to do next. And so he rightly suspected that the Spanish would try a stronger and more forceful attempt up the island. And so he marched us down the military road to the edge of a clearing where we could be positioned in the thick poor meadows and underbrush. And at this point, he decided that we needed reinforcements. And well, he also thought that this could just be a decoy and that the real attack could be a naval attack back at Frederica. And where many generals would have sent another officer to, to go and, and fetch these reinforcements and check on the said town, this, as I've said, he is a special type of general and he was not that kind of general and so he went himself. And I can remember looking back and seeing that, that, that little red dot on that horse getting smaller and smaller and smaller until we couldn't see him anymore. He disappeared around the bend. And so we were there, li waiting, leaderless, in the sweltering Georgia heat. And to make things even more miserable, those infernal insects started biting. They, they rose up out of the grass and stuck to our faces like a mask. It was terrible. But we were told to be still and quiet. We're no, no movements, no shacks, no calls, and because we were ambushing the Spanish. We had the regulars on the 42nd on one side of the road, the military road, which was this path that cut between Frederica and Fort St. Simons, and then we had the Highlanders and the Indians on the other side. 
The marsh formed a kind of crescent shape, and the Highlanders and Indians were, were to work their way around and flank the, the, the detachment of Spaniards that was coming while we kept them busy from the front. And so we waited. And we waited. Animal insects. And we waited. Still no sign of the general. But then, then we were. But then we saw it. The glint of a Spanish bayonet. It was Spanish uniforms. They sent their best troops, their grenadiers, out in front. Those white uniforms, those tall mitre caps. These grenadiers are tall grenade throwing troops. They were experienced warriors. And, and, and one grenade, one hand grenade, they could, they could throw it into the lines and, and obliterate almost an entire platoon of soldiers. And so that was quite frightening. But they hadn't noticed us just yet. And so, upon that signal, I leveled my musket, and ready for the adventure of my life, I pulled the trigger. Click. Misfire. <laughs> yes, muskets have a way of being terribly bad about misfires. It was, well, it's, it's, it's almost always unbearably humid in Georgia, and it was starting to rain. They had clouds rolling in, thankfully from the south first, and, and not from the north, and, and, and we, um, these are the worst of conditions. I could see the condensation on the barrel was built up. I, I, it was, these are the worst of conditions for, for gunpowder and the discharge of a fire dock. And so, as I was bringing back my, down my musket to recock it, to have another go at the Spanish, something that I had never experienced before happened, you see? Musket balls started whizzing back these 69 caliber. Solid lead musket balls started whizzing back at us. And I, when I had redone either, I'd fired a musket, I was used to the musket balls going out, away from me, and, and then they were coming back, and I wasn't used to being a target. This was a new, new thing for me, and so I also it, it, I heard the, the call. Granado, and, he, and the, that was the Montiano, the, the Spanish leader, calling the grenadiers to the front as if they were about to throw their grenades. And at this point, I glanced over to my side, and where once I saw men wearing, wearing these red uniforms and carrying muskets all lined up there, firing at the Spanish, there was nothing but smoke and, and full meadows and, 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 and underbrush. And, I looked back. Well, I looked back behind me, and I could see this mass of matter red uniforms gathering around. Yes, a scarlet red dot on a horse, and yes, that was General Logan. For fine time for the general to return back now that the battle's all in full, full force, and, and he wasn't even here yet. He, he was trying to return, turn around what turned out to be retreating troops. And well, I hate to say this, but I wasn't at the front of the pack, but I was among the retreating soldiers. And, as I, as I got up to make my way back, back towards, towards the retreating soldiers and Frederica, our military road, I could see that General Logelforp had turned around these troops under Captain Raymond Demery here, had turned around the soldiers. He also had, had um, reinforcements with, with him, and he was all on their way back to the battle. And when I thought the battle had been lost, I t it's found out that the grenadiers hadn't been able to throw their grenades, because they couldn't throw them through the canopy of the forest. And it had also started to rain on that side, and a war of water was moving our way. But the Lieutenant Sutherland's platoon of regulars and all the Highlanders and Indians under Lieutenant Charles Mackay had continued firing. And the, and the, the, the Highlanders had gone over onto the side and charged into them and broke their backs. They, they scattered up, and we had won. And so, the days following, decisive battle, General Oglethorpe marched us to just outside the Spanish lines at, at Fort St. Simons. And so, um, the, the, and we, to make sure, that the, the reason he did this is so we wouldn't try this again, the Spanish wouldn't, wouldn't try another attempt, and we were prepared to throw them back again and again if necessary. But they, we also, after, after our day of, of waiting there, and during the night, not getting a wink of sleep, the general realized that we needed rest. And so he marched us all the way back up the island to get some rest. Thank you, Federico. 
And so, on, during this, he also commanded the Indian scouts to patrol the, the thick woods that they knew so well in search of Spanish stragglers. And he commanded to bring in either Spanish prisoners or scouts. And often they brought in Spanish prisoners, but what they preferred to bring were Spanish scouts. And this frightened the Spanish so bad that they returned back to St. Augustine, never to, 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 to come again. This, this battle kind of ended the old Spanish hope of seizing control of British North America, what, had now, what was now 13 colonies on the East Coast. And so was the battle for Georgia. Our part of this war, of Jenkins' era, this, this part of this war helped kind of to firmly establish Georgia as a 13th colony. It, it really, this victory really made people understand that Georgia was something that was here to stay. And, and it did. And so, long live um, Worms, though, and long live um, Georgia, and long live America. And so, you all have been such a good audience that I want three cheers for king and country, all right? So when I say hip hip, huzzah, hip hip, huzzah, hip hip, huzzah, hip hip, huzzah. Hip, hip, huzzah. Thank you, very good, very good. <laughs> and uh, now if, if any of you uh, have any questions about anything, um, I would be happy to, to, to try and answer. I'll do my best. and, and it, uh, if you haven't already, go back down to the Colonial Life area. There's some demonstrators. And, and uh, just thanks, everybody, for coming. And have a good Memorial Day. Thank you. Thank you.